Now, for multiple purposes of keeping my man card intact, I can honestly say I have no idea the setting of that scene. Uh, I don't know anything about the context. I don't know anything about Weezer Brudeau or even how you pronounce that name. I don't know why anybody would ever give their eye teeth to give a whack of Weezer. I didn't even know what eye teeth were until I Googled the term and had to look up and find out that eye teeth were the canines because they're right in line with the eye. Um, I don't know anything about all that. However, I do know what it's like to feel in that moment those questions of why, 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 why. I know why, how it feels to be so angry. You want somebody else to feel what it is that you are feeling at that moment, even if it means to take your anger or your sorrow or your pain out on somebody in the form uh, of anger. And I, in short, in a situation like that, I've been in those situations where I, I'm in what we would call a senseless situation, and I'm still asking for somehow for God to make sense of a senseless situation and asking why. Now, as we looked at last week, there's a couple of problems with the question of why. Uh, one of the, the problems is sometimes the answer can't be immediately known. And so while you're in the midst of your pain, suffering, or loss, you want to know why you're going through it. But the, the answer is not something you'll, you'll know until later on down the road. We saw that in the life of Joseph, is that his brothers sell him out, Potiphar's wife sells him out, he's then sold out again when he's in prison, and years down later, somewhere between 15 to 30 years later, he's able to look back over it and say, you know, what was meant for evil, what people did to me, and all the ways I've been done wrong, God was using all of that uh, for the saving of many lives. I, I see now God's purpose and plan, so he can see it looking back, but you can't see it often when you're going through it. Uh, another reason uh, why there's a problem asking the question why is we see in the book of Job, Job's never told why, and God sort of explains to him towards the end of the book, he's like, even if I could tell you why, you wouldn't understand the answer. It, in the same way that I've, I've asked every time I get on an airplane, I, I, or I've seen an airplane fly, I look out there and I think to myself, how could something six times the size of a school bus just lift up off the ground? And I'm told with the shape of the air and pressure and lift and force, I've had explained to me multiple times, it still seems like a miracle every time I watch it. And maybe if you can understand that one, you probably at some point will get stumped somewhere between air flight and rocket space, right? Because we're not rocket scientists. Just if you look at what it takes to get a rocket off the ground, I just kind of Googled this real quick, and what I found is your task is to lift your payload 100 kilometers in altitude. You must accelerate it horizontally at 7.8 kilometers per second. That's pretty quick. So you're literally going almost seven miles in a second. That's how fast you have to get up off the ground. And to do that, it requires a force of energy of about 35 megajoules, right? Everybody follow me now with a megajoule? And to produce that kind of force, it takes a lot of fuel. The problem is there's a diminishing rate of return with your fuel because at some point, the weight of the fuel that's required to get that force makes it all the more harder to get that weight moving in that quickly of a, of, of a distance. And you look at that. Now, if somebody were explaining to you how they figured out the exact perfect match of size of fuel for the size of rocket and everything else, if they were explaining how they came to that math, how many of you in this room are feel confident you would fully understand it? Yeah, I, I'd be like, okay, that did me no good. If I went back in time to help out all of humanity, I would offer them nothing whatsoever other than to say, well, it's a pointy thing that goes up with some fuel and some point, rocket boosters fall off. That's about as much as I know, because that's about as much as I can understand. And God's looking down at Job, and he's saying, like, Job, it's the same kind of thing. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't ask you about the weather. And, and many of you have complained about weather, and you go, why, God, why? Why is it rain on my wedding day? And picture God trying to come down and explain to you the weather patterns and what's required to make the weather move around the earth to sustain life as it is, and how that impacts your wedding day. Just imagine God trying to explain all of those thermal forces. Imagine the science classes you would have to take just to be able to sit at the table in that conversation, let alone understand it, let alone be the one who's actually tweaking all the wheels and dials of the weather patterns. It would be pointless, right? And so at some point, the rocket scientist just says, can you just trust me and show up for the launch? Do you have to understand it to go and enjoy it? Do you have to understand to experience it? Can you just trust that in order for life to be sustained, Part of that is it's going to rain on your wedding day, okay? I just, it's just the way that it is. It just is. Can you just accept that and move on? Because I could explain why, but you wouldn't have the capacity to understand or comprehend the why. And so when we ask these questions of why, sometimes we can't know for many years. Sometimes we don't have the brain capacity to it. It's as if, I, I think Tim Keller said it best, any God who's big enough to complain to with our why questions 
can we also then agree that he's so big and so powerful and so knowledgeable, he probably has reasons that are far beyond our understanding. If he's big enough to blame, is he therefore not all also big enough to have reasons beyond our understanding? So when you ask these why questions, sometimes in the moment, you can't know why. Now, it's wonderful when you can. There, there's, those are like those golden nuggets of life, you know, like where you see it and you're like, oh, this is why I'm doing it. Like, for instance, birth. Why, does, why am I going through this? And then you hear the babies cry and you're like, oh, that's why, right? And immediately you're like, you know, it was all worth it, kind of, right? Um, as long as there's an epidural. So you, you say it was all worth it. Because you can see the why. There's a payoff right there. Now, if you've had a stomach cramp, you've wondered why, right? I don't know why. It just is. But it's different when you have that. Now, the other problem with the why question isn't just a matter of whether or not or when you could ever find out the answer. The other problem with the why question is it's a paralyzing question. You get stuck when you ask why questions. You can't move through your grief, you can't move past your pain, Uh, you can't move on in life to whatever comes next as long as you're asking the why questions. And maybe you've done that, maybe you're still doing that and you have a hard time moving forward, whether it be your relationship with God or even with socially or in life just because you're, you're stuck asking these why questions and because you can't get an answer to your why, you're frustrated, you're stuck. And so your mourning period, your grief period continues to last on and on and on because you're stuck in this question of why that either you can't know now or maybe can't comprehend or maybe you won't know this side of eternity. And so you keep asking the why question. And you'll move through life but with, with minimal joy and with minimal effort because you're stuck on the why question. And what has to happen at some point in your grief process is to move from the why questions to the what questions. To move from why is this happening to what must I do. From, from, from why am I here, what's the existential beyond this, or what's you know, God's plan in all this, to move to, okay, God, what is it that you want me to do right now in the here and now? And our theme verse for this series has been Psalm 126, verse 5. It says, those who sow with tears will reap uh, a harvest of joy, or reap in songs of joy. And, and in that verse is sort of like a clue or a, a pointing towards the what issue. In there, he's using a metaphor of sowing and reaping, of planting and of harvesting, and, and it's sort of like pointing you to ask the questions of, of what is it that I can sow right now? What is it I can be planting in my life? What is it I can be doing right now so that one day I'll have a song of joy to sing about? What is it in the midst of my pain and midst of my suffering that I need to plant or sow or begin to do right now so that one day down the road I can look back over this time and say it'll have been worth it. I will have redeemed it. I will have got something out of it. I can look back over it. I have a song to sing for the experience I went through and what God did for me, did through me in that time or experience. Now, as long as you're asking the why question, you will never get to a what. You will never even bother with planting or, or ever someday harvesting or reaping. Now, to begin to look at this issue of, of why and, and how you are, sorry, begin to look at this issue of, of the why question that turns to a what answer, I want to go over to uh, John chapter 9, where Jesus is uh, in a situation where this why question comes up. Why is somebody experiencing this? Why are they going through this? And Jesus begins to, his why answer is pointing them towards a what answer. Now, what happens is there's this guy who's blind. And I don't know whether the guy overhears the conversation or not. If he can, it's pretty insensitive to be like, hey, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, just picture, if you, just picture walking up to a guy who's blind or in a wheelchair. Just picture walking in a wheelchair and you're like, hey, Jesus, why is this guy in a wheelchair here, man, huh? Is it something he did? Just, and the guy's like, uh, well, thanks for letting me be your illustration today. I, I don't know how it played out, but they ended up interacting with him later on in the story. We won't get to that. I just want to do the first part where... In John chapter 9, verse 1, it says, they went along and they see this guy who was blind since birth. And so they say, hey, Jesus, why is he blind? Is it something he did or something his parents did, right? Is it because he got a Red Ryder BB gun for his, for his Christmas when he was nine years old and he shot his eye out? Is that why he's blind? Is, is it because of that? Or is it because of something his parents did? Did they make some mistakes and this was sort of a punishment on them? Uh, why is he blind? What did he do? Because in their moralistic framework, we looked at this a little bit last week, in their moralistic framework, I have this understanding that says good people have good things happen to them, bad people have bad things happen to them. Here's somebody who had a bad thing happen to them. Therefore, the only question is, is who was the bad person? And the thing about our why questions is, in one hand, we know that life is complex. We know that the topic of suffering is complex. We know the issue of pain is very complex. As a matter of fact, philosophers uh, will spend a lifetime of reading, studying, writing, and philosophizing, if you will, or thinking about the answers to the questions of why it is we go through what we go through. And even though we know that to be true, and even on the Christian side of it, uh, I, 
you would take a lifetime of study in God's word just to have a, just to scratch the surface of knowledge to be able to begin to understand the comprehensive picture of suffering. I, I don't have one verse I can just go, okay, everybody, let's turn our Bibles to this verse because this verse explains pain and suffering to us. There isn't. But I can tell you that these scriptures from beginning to end are full of the explanation of pain and suffering, the complexity of it. And, and just in a four-week series, I am just barely scratching the surface of any understanding of this. I've spent my entire lifetime of going through pain and suffering and trying to figure it out just from a, a biblical perspective with all my background and study and learning, and I feel like I'm still just barely beginning to understand what God has to say on the topic. Yet, for some reason, we still want to cry out to God, and God have given us just sort of one quick broad brush answer. Why is he like this? Just give me the simple answer. Was it something he did or something somebody else did? But the answer is much more complex and much more deeper than that. So to begin with, I just kind of want to simplify for this morning sort of three categories. And then these three categories, there's a lot of depth and there is a lifetime of studying each one of them uh, of why somebody is going through an issue of pain, suffering, and loss. And the first two are the only two that the disciples can see. Uh, the first of those two is because it's the immediate consequence of sin. So sometimes you go through pain, suffering, and loss, and it's because it is the immediate consequence of sin. And sometimes people try to act like as if they're going through some trial, but they're not really going through a trial. They're just experiencing the consequence of sin. Oh, yeah, man, I tell you, it's just been really hard. What, what, what's wrong? I got arrested. For what? Well, I robbed a bank. I don't think you need to ask God why you're in jail. I think the why is pretty obvious. You did something wrong, and you got caught, and therefore you are in jail. Uh, it was sort of a cause and effect. You hit your sister. Don't look at me and say, why? Don't ask me why you're in trouble. You know why you're in trouble. You're in trouble because you hit your sister, and actions have consequences. Sin has immediate consequences. So sometimes the reason why you're going through what you're going through is simply because it is the immediate consequence of a decision that you've made somewhere along the way. Uh, if you're texting while driving, get in an accident. Don't ask God why you got in an accident. Ask yourself why it is you thought you could drive a car without using either hand or looking at the road. I mean, the things that are very vital to it, you decided not to engage in, and then you got an accident, and you wonder why it happened. It was an immediate consequence of your decision. Other times what happens, it's a little bit harder to put the cause and effect together because it's a very delayed cause and effect. And this is the principle you see in Scripture of sowing and reaping. When you plant something, it takes a while for it to grow up out of the ground. Over in the book of Hosea, he uses this metaphor throughout the book of Hosea, and he says in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, what you, you, when you sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. He goes to explain it even further in chapter 10, verse 12. He says, when you plant seeds of righteousness, you'll reap a harvest and a crop of my love. So you need to plow the hard ground of your heart, for now is the time to be seeking the Lord. That he might come and shower salvation upon you. He says, however... If you've cultivated wickedness and raising up a thriving crop of sins, what, what metaphor, huh? If you've, if you've you know, planted all this messed up thinking, he says you raise up a crop of sin, what you've earned is the harvest of the, uh, the reward of trusting in a lie. For, so what this is, looks like is you're 65 years old, you get diagnosed with psori uh, uh, psoriasis of the liver. Is that it, psoriasis? Cirrhosis, psoriasis, psoriasis of skin. Cirrhosis of the liver. Maybe you could get it. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Uh, a cirrhosis of the liver. And the doctor looks at you and he says, hey, do you have a drinking problem? He says, well, yes, I've been drinking all of my life. He says, well, that's why you have cirrhosis of the liver. In that moment, don't cry out and ask God, why, why me? The doctor just told you why you. The why of you was because you made a choice to turn to alcohol your entire life, and this is sort of a consequence of those decisions over a lifetime. Other times, it's things like you've got this pattern of lying and cheating, and you did it in school, and you lied to your parents, and you lied to your friends, and then you lied at your work, and then all of a sudden, you find out that nobody will trust you with a job, nobody will trust you in a relationship, and you wonder, why is, it my, life, why is my life like this? I'll tell you why. You are reaping what you've sown for a lifetime. This pattern of deceit and lying and cheating is just where this leads. You see selfish people who only care about themselves and then find themselves one day all alone. And they say, how come nobody cares about me? Because you're the only person who cares about you. You care about yourself and you care about nobody else, so nobody cares about you. It's just, that's a part of sowing and reaping. Now, it took a long time to get to that point. It took a long time to harvest what it is you've been sowing all your life. But at some point, either through a friend, a counselor, or your own introspection, you can move to the point where you can answer the why question, if you're honest with yourself. And so when they look at this guy who's blind, they go, why is he blind? What did he do? Did he do something or did somebody else do something? Is this just a long-term effect of sin? What, what, what's really going on in this guy's life? And Jesus points to the third reason for why we go through stuff, and this is where the uh, issue of, of the why really comes in, and that is 
we have to understand we live in a fallen and broken world. And some of the pain, suffering, and trials and loss you go through is simply because we live after the fall. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, there was a world that was perfect. There was a world that never had any of this, these problems in it. Adam and Eve made a decision on behalf of the entire human race, which we've all replicated. It's not like as if the only people who ever done it, and basically said, God, I'm going to do my own thing. I can be my own boss. I don't want you to be in control of things. I want to be, have the freedom to live my own life. And God says, you want the freedom to live your own life? Fine, have, it, have the freedom to live your own life. And so we push God out of our life to a certain extent, and God pushed us out of the Garden of Eden, and so now we live in what we call a fallen and broken world. And so uh, all of our uh, sociological systems and our systems of nature and weather and everything else has been thrown into chaos as a result of that. And so we live in a fallen and broken world. And so much of the pain, suffering, and loss is all attributed to the, to the fallen and broken world we live in. Sort of to explain this, it's like, you know, if you steal from a store, you will get caught and you will pay a fine, right? Direct, recall, direct result, cause and effect. At the same time, though, all of us, when we go shopping, we are all paying for people stealing, right? You, you, don't, think that the, you don't think Harris Teeter just eats that loss, do you? No, they sort of spread out the cost of everything that's been shoplifted from their store over the cost of all of their goods, right? They spread out the cost of security over all their goods. They spread out the cost of all of their uh, internet security over all of their goods, right? How much less would stuff cost if they didn't have to worry about any of that? You could drive those prices way, way down, right? But we all face higher prices simply because we live in a world where theft, both from with outside the company and within the company, is a reality, and so they compensate by charging us a higher rate for all the products that we buy. In the same way, nobody gets to this life unscathed. Every one of us deals with the consequences of pain, suffering, and loss, whether it be you know, stuff you didn't even do. It could be somebody you're in a relationship with and what they did. It could be you know, part of the, the government or the society or the world or the city you live in. Now, and sometimes these get very complex because you can have three people who are in the exact same situation for each of these three reasons, and you may not know why when you first look at them. And sometimes we're quick to judge somebody, like these disciples were, when you don't know. Let's take somebody who's broke. Now, there's three guys. All three of them are broke. Don't have a, hardly have a dollar to their name and are trying to figure out where the next meal is going to come from. Guy number one had a normal life, went to Vegas on a weekend, has a gambling problem, and so when he went to Vegas on a weekend, he maxed out all of his credit cards, went and mortgaged his house, lost everything, and he comes home absolutely broke. Guy number two has got a pattern of laziness and horrible spending, and he's always been spending more than he's ever made, and he finally, after getting written up four times for insubordination at his work and for not doing his job, he finally got fired, and he's got a mountain of debt that he can't possibly pay even if he had a job, and now he's also in the same situation as the first guy, and he is broke. It's taken a lifetime to get to that point, but now he's reaping the consequence of all that. The third guy was born in Nicaragua. That's it. That's all I got for that story. You know, the average income in the capital is $340 a year. What did he do to deserve that? He was born in the wrong place? No, he's just born in Managua. That's it. Like the other ones, you're like, okay, this guy, what he needs to do, he needs to get his life right. He needs, not, you know, he needs, to, he needs to maybe start going to celebrate recovery, get, you know, get that gambling under control so he can rebuild his life and do right. The second guy, he needs to get his life under control. He needs to go to a group like Celebrate Recovery where he can get his life in order and he can begin making better decisions and he can work his way back up, you know, find a job, any job, any job will do, and be able to you know, work that Dave Ramsey system, start going to Financial Peace University. The third guy, move? I, I don't know, what, what, do you, what do you tell that guy? Why is he in his situation? Why, oh, why, oh, why God? Now, you could go into it. I listened to a very fascinating book that would probably bore most of you on why it is that there's poverty around the world and the situations that result in it. And you look at the his history of both sociological issues, environmental issues, and governmental policies and issues that have impacted poverty throughout the world in different areas and different pockets and, and how areas of the, uh, the world were developed and how they were colonized and how they were conquered and you look at all these different factors at all, it's a very, very complex issue. And anybody who tries to simplify it out by some arbitrary means is doing a disservice. It's a very complex answer to why they're in that situation. In the same way why your pain and your suffering is happening is very complex. Now, from the outside looking in, it's really interesting. Our own political parties have their own views as to why somebody's broke, right? One side says, well, it's all their fault. They need to get better. The other side says, no, it's some combination of, of historical, sociological, environmental, and political uh, decisions that have ramifications for these individuals and this group of people. And so they fight over it back and forth, right? Aren't those the two political parties right now, summed up in a nutshell? I don't know. It's just kind of funny the way these plan out. So whose fault is it? Why is he poor, Jesus? His fault or somebody else's? 
Why is he blind, Jesus? His fault or somebody else's? And Jesus is like, no, no, we're not, it's, we're not gonna, we're not, the, the, the why question needs to point you to a what answer. And so Jesus points them back and he says, this isn't about the consequence of his sin or his parents' sin. Uh, because when you, have a, when you have a sin issue, the, the response is repentance, right? When you've done something wrong, the answer is repentance. So if, you, if, if, it's, if, it's a, if, it's, if it's a consequence, repent. Whether it be a lifetime of sin or an immediate sin, repent. That's what happens with the prodigal son. He's both kind of the immediate consequence and a long-term consequence of his sinful choices. Luke chapter 15, he, he goes out, spends all of his money. He ends up all alone wanting to eat what the pigs are eating. It says he comes to his senses and he wants to repent. But repentance isn't what you point to when you are in a situation that's just a part of life, part of living in a fallen and broken world. And so Jesus looks at me and says, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. You know, this suffering that's just a part of life, my response is, is to look and say, God, how can this be used for your glory to be a testimony of my love for you? Because when we begin a relationship, God, you and me, I said for better or for worse. I looked at you, God, I said for richer or for poor. I said whether in sickness or in health, forsaking all others, God, I'm with you for all eternity. You might say, well, that sounds like marriage. That's what it means to have a relationship with God. Marriage is just a picture of the loving relationship that God wants to have with you and me for all eternity. That's why marriage is so important and so sacred to God. Because, because he says, this is, a, this is a picture, an example of the kind of relationship I want to have with you. And, and the question really is for you is, when you go through, what happens if it's not better but it's worse? What happens if it's not richer but it's poor? What happens if it's, if it's not health but it's sickness? What happens if there's somebody else who comes along, some other temptation that comes along? What will you do? The true relationship is the one that endures, and you're looking, and God's saying, will your relationship be one that endures the test of time, that no matter what comes into your life, you're a rock? That was a question of Job. Satan asked that question. God, he'll bail on you as soon as the worst happens, as soon as the poor happens, as soon as the the sickness happens, and what happens to Job? The worst happens, he loses everything, the sickness happens, uh, he gets sick, he's got boils all over his sin, um, and he loses all of his money. The worst happens, but what does he say? Naked I came in the world, naked all depart. Name of the Lord will be praised. What am I, accept the good from God but not the bad? No, I'm here to the end. I said for better or for worse. I'm in it through the long haul. And Jesus looking and says, sometimes the stuff that comes into your life is simply to give you the opportunity to show the world the valid, valid nature of your relationship with God. Now, what you'll see in the Bible is there are a lot of books of the Bible that, talk, that are really, pretty much dedicated just to pain and suffering. There's a whole book called Lamentations. I'll just let you guess what that book's all about. The book of Job, many of y'all know about Job. Job's a quintessential picture of a guy who has pain and suffering. But other books like 2 Corinthians and 1 Peter, uh, the book of Hebrews, the book of Revelation, they're all written to people who are going through immense, amazing suffering. And if you look at the themes throughout each and every one of those, it's God writing to you and to me in the midst of our pain and how we're supposed to handle it and what we can do in the midst of it. I'm just going to summarize the book of 1 Peter to you. I'm going to go through 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, 2, and 3 to show you some highlights and show you clearly he's talking to a group of people who are going through suffering. We, we touched on this a little bit last week. He says, he says, in all this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer the grief of many kinds of trials. I mean, there's so much in here. I just want to point out one thing. When he says, right now you're rejoicing, he also says, right now you're going through trials. There's present tense on both of those verbs. Most of the time, I can rejoice looking back over it and I say, okay, God, I see what you did there. Or, thank God it's over, I can rejoice in that. Or, thank God for my healing. I, I can oftentimes rejoice in hindsight, but it's really hard to rejoice in the present or rejoice with foresight. To say, God, I know you, like that song we just sang a minute ago. For some of you who are singing that, you know, God, he's never failed me. Some of you are looking back over your time and you sing that song rejoicing over a time where God's healed you or come through for you. The hard place to sing, though, is when you're in the midst of it and you're in the fire right now. Right? When you're down in the valley or you're trying to climb up a hill and it doesn't seem like there's any light at the end of the tunnel and you're wondering, God, are you there for me right now? That's the hard part to, to continue to rejoice in the midst of it. He says, no, we rejoice even though now for a little while we face all kinds of trials. And he says, these all come into your life. Why? So that God's good work might be displayed in you. That's what Jesus says. He says it here. He says, um, so that it would prove the genuineness of your faith. So you have a legit relationship that everybody would see. You know, I've seen a lot of Christians who, who talk the talk, but as I see you walk through this and I see the way that, way that you've gone through pain and suffering and loss and heartache and betrayal, there's something about your relationship with God that I don't see everywhere else. 
It says that it would be a testimony to this. It says it might result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. People look. Some of y'all know my, my life story and my, my first marriage before my wife passed and the difficulties and the trials that we experienced along the way. Uh, and I get often asked the question as we went through the difficult times, you know, how did you stay with her? Why did you stay with her? Looking back, would you do it again? It's a hard question to answer. I just, from that, just summarize, it was difficult, okay? Just summarize that. And if you've been married, just fill in your own experience, right? And my answer back was, I said, you know, I, I wondered that a lot. Um, two years, we, we were married 12 years. Two years in, we went to divorce court, and we're literally five minutes away from finalizing a divorce and couldn't because the court had closed, long story, went back the next morning and decided not to go through with it. And I often wondered, should I have gone through with it because of how difficult things were? And the honest answer is I didn't know until I was holding her in my arms watching her die. And in that moment, I had this sense that that was the one decision that I'm more proud of than anything else I will do for the rest of my life period. Um, because I was able to look to God and say, God, my baby girl, she's broken. She needs your healing. It's only going to come from you. But she's in a lot better place now than she was when I met her. And I've been faithful to the commitment I've made to her, and I give her back to you. And there's this moment where, just as Jesus came just to take her away, you have this moment where he says that it would result in praise and glory and honor for Jesus Christ. And may the suffering you go through might be an opportunity for God's work to be displayed in your life. And he goes on into chapter two and he says, he says there's these other situations now and there they have a system of slavery. Is their economic system just focus on our own situation where we have people, employers, employees. And he says, you know, there's sometimes where you have these situations where you work for a good boss and everything's good, but sometimes you work for a really bad boss and even though you don't do anything wrong, you're still punished harshly for it. And you're treated horribly for it. And some of you have been denied promotions. You've been looked over and you've been fired or you've been sort of put out all because of no fault of your own, just because of the way the system is or because whoever it was you were working for, whoever it was who gave you your fit rep or whatever it might be has just totally messed you over along the way. And he looks back over and he says, listen, if you suffer because you were an idiot at work, nobody's going to pat you on the back for your suffering. They're going to look at you and say, you were an idiot at work, right? Nobody feels sorry for that. He says, but when you go through a time of suffering and you handle it with grace and with dignity and you continue to lean into God and say, God, I don't know what you're going to show me in this situation. I don't know what's going to come out of this situation, but I trust you for wherever you're leading and whatever you're going to do in this, that you got my back and you'll always be with me. There will be people who will look at that and go, I want some of that in my life. And that's sort of a summary of what he talks about in chapter two. And then he gets to chapter three and he says, you know, after all, he sort of summarizes, he goes into some other stuff and he sort of summarizes up that sort of thought in chapter three, verse 13. He says, you know, after all, who's going to harm you for doing good? Like, well, okay, even sometimes that happens, but you're going to be blessed if that does happen. And then he says this statement, he says, just keep in mind, everybody's going to suffer, okay? He says, but it's better if it's God's will that you suffer for doing good rather than being a moron. I take him some liberties with the text, but you, you read it and you'll see if I'm right or not. When it, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. He basically says, you know, every, you're, you're going to have suffering and pain in your life, right? You can't be good enough or moral enough or righteous enough to avoid suffering because we live in a fallen, broken world. That's why bad things happen to good people. So it's going to happen. But there are sometimes you've gone through pain, suffering, and loss, and you look back and you go, yeah, I was an idiot. There are sometimes you look back over it and you go, you know, God, I didn't do anything to deserve this but I'll take the good from you just like I'll take the bad from you. And I'm not going to blame you or get mad at you. I'm just going to accept it and allow you to work th through me in it. That's what Paul does in 2 Th Corinthians chapter 12. He says, three times I prayed, God, take away this problem, take away this problem, take away this issue, and God never does. And he says, all right, God, if, 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 if I'm stuck with it, I'm stuck with it. But here's what this does. Because of this weakness, it's going to force me to rely on you. So in the end, whenever I do anything or accomplish anything, people are going to look at me and go, it certainly wasn't that idiot who did it. Clearly, God it must have had some hand in this along the way because you're not much to look at. And he's like, and you know, that's the best, isn't it? And somebody can look and say it was clearly God. Like those times where 
there are some times where people come back and they say, hey, uh, I just had this, you know, I went to the doctor and I took this medicine and now I'm all better. And we go, yay, praise God and medicine, praise God and medicine. There's other times where you go, doctor's got nothing, but the tumor's gone. Praise God for that, right? What about your life? Well, you're Mike. I'm going to have fun with you, Mike. Really? Go back 10 years into his life and somebody say, God's going to use him in an amazing way to lead people to celebrate their recovery from drugs, alcohol, pain, suffering, loss, PTSD, anger. You'd look at him and go, no. And he'd smile back and he'd go, yeah, I know. There must be God doing something here, huh? Right? I don't know why. I know the reason he went to jail is because he was an idiot. <laughs> but what he meant for evil, God used for good. And there were a lot of other pain and suffering that came into his life that weren't in those first two categories. They were in the third, if you know his story. Why? Jesus would say, so that God's good work and purposes might be shown through him. And you see these things lived out. And it's an encouragement to all of us that there is a legitimacy to this thing about God. People may want to argue you about evolution. They may want to argue you uh, about all different kinds of issues that relate to whether or not there is a God or not. But you can't argue that. And there's no other explanation for it. So why did all that happen? I don't know the big why, but I know what Mike's done. And what he has done has resulted in what Jesus said so the good works of God might be displayed in him. May that be your testimony, that when you go through the whys of life, you stop for a moment and say, God, I don't know the why. I don't even know if I could ever possibly comprehend the why. I would love to know the why someday, whether this side of eternity or the other. But right now, help me move from the why to the what. What can I do to plant? What can I do to sow? What can I do to begin to seek out an opportunity that one day I'll look back and have a testimony about this, a song to sing about this, that I'll, that I'll be able to bring all people into a relationship with you because of what I've gone through in the midst of this situation. Let that be my life and what this is all about for me. We join things we pray. Father, I thank you for the testimony of so many people who are here in this room that are part of this church and have been a part of my life. They've been a living example, Father, that the stuff they've gone through has not resulted of their sin or somebody else's sin. It's just been a part of life. But it's also been what you have used to be a powerful witness and a testimony of your great love, of your great grace, of your power to use even the broken things, your ability to bring beauty out of ashes your ability to restore and to renew and to bring new life. Father, for those who are going to the midst of the furnace and the fire and have difficult times right now, Father, will you give them the faith and the resolve to move past the whys that they cannot possibly answer and seek you out for the what? What can I do right now, Father, that someday will cause me to sing a song of joy, to be able to come into a worship experience like this morning and to be singing not just words on a screen but be able to sing about the testimony of my life. I ask all these things of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.